Hello and welcome to Professor Hansen's series on tank design and philosophy. On today's docket, why the Tiger tank isn't actually as good as people think it is. I am Professor Hansen, and I will be your guide to the fascinating world of tank history. Now, what do you think you know about the Tiger tank? Everybody knows that it's got the thickest armor for the time period anyways. It was introduced in 1942, and at that time, the only other tank with a comparable amount of armor would be the Char B1 Biz, which had an upper front plate, plate thickness of around 65 millimeters. The Tiger I had an upper front plate thickness of over 100 millimeters thick. No Allied gun could really get through this, and as such, it was an absolute menace on the front lines. Now, what else do we know about it? It's very boxy. As you can see in the image there, this tank is not one for using sloped armor. It has very flat front plates, which is not as conducive to blocking rounds, but their sheer thickness can make up for this with a lot of tank rounds. What else do we know about it? It's kind of slow. Because it weighs so much, it's not the fastest of tanks, and it's nowhere near as fast as some of the British cavalry tanks, which were very good at line breaking and the such. This was more of a slower advance at the infantry and blast in the line sort of guy. What else do we know? Huge gun. It mounts the Flak 88, which was notorious for demolishing any sort of allied tanks in the North African campaign and all across Germany and Europe in general. That gun killed more tanks than any other in German service during the entire course of the war, both in its emplacement form and in the turrets of tanks such as this. What else do we know? It scared the crap out of the allies. Everybody was afraid of this thing. You see a 54-ton monster rolling down the road with a gun that'll eat you and your children, and you're not really going to want to engage that if you can avoid it. So, it kind of caused a little bit of panic among Allied intelligence. People often regard it as the best tank of the war, as the best designed one, because it had so many more of what we'd consider modern features, such as range finders and improved gun sights and second or first stage storage of ammo and ready racks and on the later marks anyways, wet ammo storage. These were not things that its contemporaries had at the time, but would later pick up. And it's often considered that had they been produced in more numbers, they might have won the war. Which is a potentiality, I suppose. What was it up against? The Sherman. The Sherman was also introduced in 1942. It was a medium tank, unlike the Tiger, which was a heavy tank. The Americans did not really have a heavy tank per se at this point in the war, so the Tiger was most predominantly facing the Shermans, which fought both for the British, the French, which fought for the British, the French, and the Americans. Um, common thoughts on the Sherman tank is that it's kind of, as the kids would say, mid. It doesn't really do any one thing particularly well. It is especially true when you look at its main cannon. This is the M3 75mm gun. It was capable as an anti-emplacement gun and fired a pretty decent high explosive round. However, as an anti-tank gun, it was not the most effective. At ranges of 100 meter meters against 100 millimeters of armor, it would bounce. Guess what has 100 millimeters of armor on its front plate and engages at ranges of over 1,000 meters? That's right, that's a Tiger. The main gun on this Sherman could not get through the front plate of a Tiger at all. So essentially you have a bunker being shot at by a bunch of rifles. It was also pretty under-armored. The front plate on the Sherman there is only has a thickness of 55 millimeters, and although it is sloped, it is not the best design. The slope had a tendency to bounce rounds directly into the turret, which is where a lot of the crew is, which was not optimal. This was fixed in later marks of the Sherman, but on the initial run variant, this was not the case. It was pretty under-armored along the sides as well, with armor thickness varying between 30 and as low as 15 millimeters thick, which is essentially paper-thin in terms of armored vehicles. It also had the issue of being called the Tommy Cooker by Germans, and this was because the early marks of Sherman were notorious for catching fire when shot. Uh, this was due to a few factors, namely that the fuel tank was kind of far forward and in an easily hittable position where a round to go through the front half of the tank, which was pretty common. So a round would strike the fuel tank and set the entire thing on fire, hence the term Tommy Cooker. It also had a tendency to catch the ammo storage, which was right in the front of the tank behind that upper front plate, which would again set the tank ablaze and, you know, burning Americans and such. Um, it's also been regarded as overly tall. As you can see, it's got a weird sort of triangle shape where it kind of 
diminuendos towards the back end. Initially, this was due to the fact that it had to mount an entire radial engine in the back, and this was the case for the M4 and M4A1. This radial engine was the same used on the P-36 Warhawk fighters, and so they decided to mount it in a tank, and so it had to be tall to accommodate the tallness of the radial engine. Later marks of Shermans do not use the radial engine, but still kept its general dimensions because at that point it was already established and they needed to keep common parts between them. So, how would the two interact when they met up? The Sherman 75 can't get to the front of any Tiger, so they'd often have to get around to the side of them, which can be a challenge, especially if the Tiger has other tank support and infantry support. Uh, the Sherman tanks would get obliterated from just one hit from that massive 88mm gun that the Tiger I is sporting, which is not conducive to survival. And it was c commonly said that it would take five Shermans to kill even just one Tiger. This was technically the case, but I'll get into why this is technically more false later on. And Tigers could pick off Shermans at long range. The American M375 was not very good at ranged killing. It was a rather low velocity round, and it already had poor penetration, and so you put it at range, its penetration is worse, and you're even less likely to get through the front of the Tiger. This also meant that shell drop-off was really bad, because a round that is traveling slower, you have to aim your gun higher to hit this, a target at the same distance as a round that's going faster, which meant that crews would often take longer to aim because they had to account for more elevation change. Tigers, on the other hand, had a very high velocity round, they didn't have to account for as much uh, time to aim in on sighted targets. As well as this, that higher velocity round also means that it has a lot more penetration. So even if the Allies did have a super heavy tank, the German 88 would still rip right through it because of its insane armor-piercing abilities. Um, US tankers, like I previously said, feared the Tiger. It was so incredibly bad, in fact, that they were not allowed to mention how good the Tiger was in any sort of combat performance in the uh, 1943 1944 campaigns. This was from direct order from some of the top generals because they didn't want to be spreading what was dubbed Tiger Phobia, and that was the fact that Allied crew tanker crews would come across German tanks that were not Tigers, but because they were kind of boxy, as most German tanks were, they would freak out and think there was a whole line of Tigers when in reality it was just a line of Panther IVs, which were pretty easy to deal with. And so they didn't want to spread this among the troops and have issues with intelligence and crews not wanting to engage because they think a line of Panzer threes is going to be an insane force of Tigers when it is in fact and not when it is in fact not. And this is because of the Tigers psychological effect on U S tank crews and British tank crews to some extent. So why the Tiger didn't actually show up to a lot of these fights. Um, the Tiger was notoriously unreliable. It's engine broke down constantly. And in fact, if you were just had one sitting out in a field, you'd have to turn the engine over once every two hours, because otherwise it would stall and you wouldn't be able to get it started again without some serious maintenance. This was not the case for all engines, obviously, but the ones that were more heavily used certainly had this problem. Another issue was that it loved to consume petrol. This thing drank an insane amount of fuel, and this is not a good thing in the late war when Germany does not have that much fuel. The original intention for German fuel, because they don't have any colonies producing fuel, so they had to figure out some way to get it. This leads to the Battle of Stalingrad in 1942-1943, because Stalingrad sits on a large oil field. They do not successfully take Stalingrad, so Germany has no oil. And they have no oil means they have no petrol, means that these massive tanks that take up a ton of fuel cannot go anywhere. And so there were accounts as the Allies came through France of finding Tigers that were perfectly fine mechanically, but the, the crews had abandoned due to a lack of fuel and or ammunition. So another issue they suffered from was lack of ammunition. As well as that, there is a lot of transmission issues. The Tiger weighs a ton, and its engine was vastly overpowered for its designed transmission. This meant that the Tigers would consistently break transmissions at a rate far higher than any other Axis tank. Compound that with, as you can see in the image there, road wheel issues. The road wheels are the thing that engage the tracks at the bottom of the tank, and the road wheels on the Tiger and Panther series tanks were overlapping. So let's say you hit one of the back road wheels with a 76mm round. You would have to take off the entire tracks of the Tiger tank, which was in itself quite the task because the tracks were rather massive and rather heavy. But not only that, you would have to pull off all the other road wheels in front of the broken one to fix that component. And this led to a lot of downtime and repairs for things that took Allied crews a lot less time. In terms of transmission issues, once again, part of the issue of serviceability of the Tiger tank was that to fix the transmission, they would have to open the entire back hatch of the Tiger, pull out its entire 
600 horsepower engine, which weighs a ton and required a lot of specialized equipment to get out, and then they could pull out the transmission and stick in a new one. This was not really efficient in the slightest, and it was something that they suffered with constantly. This also led to parts shortages because there weren't enough transmissions to fix how many Tigers were breaking them constantly. As well as that, they were very expensive to produce. They cost four times what a Panzer IV would cost, and they took forever. It took over 300,000 man-hours to produce one Tiger from scratch, and in comparison, the US tank, the M4 Sherman, took under, I think, 500 hours, which is relatively not that much. And so what this meant is that there were a lot more Shermans than there were Tigers. And the Sherman also didn't really cost that much. It cost less than a Panzer IV to produce, actually, if you convert the currencies. As well as that, maintenance was expensive. All those spare transmissions and engines did not come cheap to the German economy. And like I said earlier, they took forever to install. So if a Tiger was damaged in combat, it would take several days of downtime to get it back into operational service. And again, as I mentioned earlier, they required specialized crews of both maintenance and driver to get these things to move. They are incredibly complex machines, so you have to have people that, are know, that know what they're doing to crew one of them, and people that have worked on them for a long time to be able to get them to run smoothly. And they also required a lot of specialized tools. For example, the road wheels had specialized lug nuts that could only be taken off by a certain type of wrench, and of course there were shortages of this wrench, which meant that crews were often resorted to taking sledgehammers and individually whacking road wheels off, which is not good for overall health of the tank and longevity. Now, why the Sherman was Mr. Worldwide, as the kids would say. It was cheap and quick to produce. As I said, 300 man-hours, you got one of these things out the door, sometimes less. Uh, they were relatively cheap as well, less than the Panzer IV. They were cheap and quick to maintain. So, on the Panzer, or Pan Tiger, sorry, it had overlapping road wheels. This is not the case on the Sherman. All of the Sherman's um, suspension assembly and road wheels are open air, and anybody with a spanner, essentially, can get over there and pull one off and put a new one on. It took under 20 minutes to replace a full suspension bogey on a Sherman, and it took several hours to do so on a Tiger. On a Sherman, you didn't have to take off the tracks to replace suspension components either, which also helped save on downtime. Now, the Sherman didn't break as nearly as many transmissions as the Tiger did, but it still did on occasion. So, to solve this problem, you can see on Shermans that, like, bulbous bit on the lower front, that is a panel that can be removed. That is where the transmission is. So, and again, anybody with a spanner could pull this front plate off and essentially pull the transmission out of the front of the tank and get a new one in in under an hour. And so if it did break a transmission, really quick repair. As well as that, the engine on these things, they had tons of spares lying around and they were relatively easy to get out of the back of the tank because it had an open back door hatch. So they could essentially just wheel one out, stick a new one in. This was true of most of the parts on the Sherman, which meant they were easy and quick to repair, and if one gets damaged, you can send it back to the depot, and five hours later, it's right back in service. As well as that, there's a ton more Shermans in Europe than there are Tigers. By the end of the war, only about 1,200 Tigers had been produced. In comparison, there were over 15,000 Shermans. And in the time, so it took about two weeks to produce a Tiger. In the time that it took to produce one Tiger, over 500 Shermans could have arrived in Europe. Crews and all that is. And as well as that, you'd have to train the crew for the Tiger and such. And Shermans were incredibly easy to crew. There's some famous quotes out there that say, if you can drive a Ford, you can drive a Sherman. They were pretty intuitive and pretty easy to drive. Um, they also had universal parts with other models. For example, the earlier M3 Lee shared the entire pretty much lower half with the M4 Sherman. They shared the same suspension components, the same transmission, the same engine. Um, there were 75mm guns shared uh, ammunition. As well as that, the uh, M375 on all the Shermans fired the same ammunition as the British Cromwell tank, which was also 75mm. It shared ammunition with a whole bunch of other lighter vehicles as well, including the M24 Chaffee. And they also had a lot of other uh, parts that were standardized between these models, so it didn't matter what country the Sherman was fighting under, there was probably parts for it. And this leads to the ease of standardization and the fact that many countries adopt it because it is so easy to maintain, produce, and get parts for as well as that, it was pretty easy to transport. The Tigers weighed a ton and couldn't go over a lot, or they weighed 57 tons, which is a ton in figurative speech, but they couldn't really go over a lot of bridges and they had to be carried on specialized rail cars with specialized tracks that had to be taken off and then put back on uh, to get them off the rail cars. Shermans, by comparison, are really easy to transport in shipping containers and like they could fly them in on certain cargo jets and they could take them pretty much anywhere. They're really easy to transport, they're really easy to get places. And they would come over on cargo ships by the dozens uh, into 
Germany, and the rest of Europe. So, in conclusion, the Sherman was substantially better of a tank uh, because of ways that actually matter in a war. Like the quote says, it doesn't matter how good your tank is, if you can't produce many and you can't make them get to the battlefield in one piece, it doesn't matter. Um, logistics are what win wars, as the quote says. It's not how good your tank is, it's it's logistics. And the Sherman just did logistics so well. All the aspects of producibility, maintenance ability, and general ease of maintenance made made it the much more superior tank and the fact that there are so many more of them. So at the beginning I mentioned that it took five Shermans to kill one Tiger. This was not because the Tiger could kill five Shermans in one sitting. This is because Sherman tanks often ran around in crews of five due to US tank doctrine. And five Shermans sure could kill a Tiger, as could two, as could one. In fact, actually I missed a bit here. Um, as you can see in the photo on the right, the Shermans were pretty modular. That is a Sherman with a British 17-pound gun on it. As I mentioned, the 75mm M3 gun on earlier Sherman models couldn't get through the front of a Tiger. The British 17-pounder sure could. As well as the 17-pounder, a variety of other guns were mounted on the front of Shermans, including the American 76, which was about equivalent to the British one. Could again, And that could again get through the front of a Tiger. As well as that, there were also a lot of variations of Shermans for anti-aircraft use for um, engineering vehicle use. The Sherman was incredibly modular for a variety of applications. And going back to this slide, there was versions of the Sherman called the Jumbo, on which a second front plate of a Sherman was welded onto the first one, giving it the upper front plate thickness of a Tiger with the benefit of being sloped. These Shermans were slower and more used as assault tanks, but they did exist. And they were very, very effective on the battlefield. And so the Sherman's modu modularity was another reason it was so widely adopted and so widely effective. And so the Sherman would serve in the armies, of, like I said, almost every allied nation in World War II and in the post-war. They served in Korea, Vietnam. They were all over the place. And it was really the king of logistics, and that is why it is the better tank. So that wraps it up for this lecture. I would like you, the students, to go through the rest of the materials I have attached to today's lesson, and at the end to do the synthesis essay that will be due Monday. Thank you very much, and see you next time.